No hiding, no dead religion, no more excuses. Period. Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 as we conclude our sermon series through the book of 1 Corinthians and seeing life through the lens of the gospel. We won't have a series this time because there's just one chapter. We're going to do it all today, but I've entitled this if it would have been a series. It could have been a series, actually. We could have done three more weeks on this, but I'm going to wrap it up today. But we're calling this series, we would call it Changed. And the title of the message today is The Gospel Impacts Everything. And when you think about that bumper we just watched, don't we make a lot of excuses as believers? And Jesus made no excuse on the cross. And so I would challenge you today, church, that today is going to be a message that I am going to preface and say this. It is that we are expository in our preaching. We have come to this text. We will not, not preach it. We will not, not talk about it. We will teach it. However, if you are visiting with us today, just understand at least for a moment that the first part of this message, I am going to be speaking to the members of Northside Baptist Church. Um, this is a section of scripture that God is speaking to the church at Corinth. And I believe Paul, if he was standing here today, would be saying, I am speaking this part to Northside. So if you are a visitor today, understand that there is something that you can learn from it too. But understand I am not preaching to you, but maybe you can be edified in God's word as well. And then there's a few other things that we'll finish up today about our commitment and about our relationships that we can all benefit from that Paul had to say in concluding this message in Corinthians. And so if you remember, Paul began this letter in 1 Corinthians because he was concerned about the spiritual condition of the people in Corinth. He started his letter, if you remember, addressing division that was found in the church. Remember, his teaching that Christ is the center of everything and the church should be united around in Christ. But instead, if you remember, the church had its own little factions. It had its groups of people who were kind of subdivided inside one public gathering of believers... Uh, and, and in that section of the scripture, we titled it Unified. That was the series we preached through in chapters 1 through 4 of Paul trying to bring them back together, united. He then moves on to answering questions from them that he received in the letter that we know that he received from them. And he begins to answer questions about this letter. He addressed things like the harm of sexual immorality, what it looks like when believers end up in lawsuits together, and what the picture of marriage should look like. He's answering questions that they had. This was in chapters 5 through 7. We call that integrity. He moves on to uh, addressing stumbling blocks that we face, like should we eat food sacrificed to idols or not? Uh, what about who to follow? Remember he talked on Paul or Apollos and he tried to point us that we should actually be following Christ, not a man. And that we are actually servants who are to preach the gospel. He warned them of worshiping idols. He challenged them to do all things for God's glory. This was chapters 8 through 10 in our series we called Love. And in chapters 11 through 14 we encouraged our series on encouragement. Taught us how to act in worship. We talked about the proper places and positions of people, pastors, and all of those types of things to have orderly worship. And in the last series, the last three weeks, we've been, we're in a series called Encouragement. It's where we got to the meat of the gospel. As we have mentioned already, we spent three weeks preaching on the resurrection of Christ and the, and the importance and the vitalness of this great event that happened in history. It is be because of that resurrection that you and I have the faith that we have. It is the one key that defeated our greatest enemy in death. And then we wrapped it, wrapped it up uh, by giving us the reason for it all. That's what we're going to talk about today, is the reason for it all. Many of you might think, why would Paul not have stopped his letter with the greatest thing that he could say when he pointed people to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Isn't that a good place to stop? I mean, isn't that all that we really need? That as people, if, if we've heard that Jesus is who he said he is, and that we heard the gospel, which Paul said in the beginning of 15, I remind you of the gospel of which I preached to you. 
that Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross, and that he rose from the grave. Isn't that enough that if we heard that as believers and we heard the gospel, shouldn't that be enough for us as believers? But yet Paul's got a whole nother like finishing paragraph. We would call it chapter 16. There would have not been chapters and verses in the original writing that Paul wrote. But in chapter 16 we see that there is a whole nother chapter that Paul is going to address to the church. And I think it's something that if he was here today he would say it to us as well. In our study of the gospel impacts everything. Paul wanted us to understand that because of the resurrection. And because of our faith, it will change the way we live. You're no longer you. You've been bought with a price. And Paul says, listen, it's because of the resurrection that you should be living a certain way. Or at least you should. And so I'm going to ask you today, if you're struggling with the issues that Paul addresses, I want to challenge you today to begin to pray and to seek the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and to try to apply and understand the teaching that God is giving us here so that we can be more obedient to Christ. And listen, I, I've got something to tell you, and this is where I'm going to start and preach it to the church. Listen, you need to understand something. Delayed obedience to what Christ has called us to is disobedience. And Paul's going to address some stuff here that I think is very, very important. It's not something that I'm going to apologize about. It is not something that I am going to back down from. Matter of fact, it is something that I'm going to boldly proclaim from the Word of God today. And so, if you would stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we are going to read this whole text today. Verse 1 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredited by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Verse 5, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you. For he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace. That he may return to me for I'm expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers. But it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, Achaia, that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send, your, send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you today. As we open this text and we may be confused about the order and the structure, God, I think you have something very important in the way you've organized your word for us today. And I pray today, God, that we would receive your word. We would receive it in the spirit it was intended to be done. And that, God, we would be obedient to what you've called us to do. And that is the work in your will of, ca of casting the vision, of, of sharing your love with all of those we come in contact with. So God, may you be glorified today in the teaching and preaching of your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. 
There's a few things that I see in the text today that I want us to talk about when we think about how the gospel impacts everything. At first, when I was studying this, I'm too probably, if you read the scripture, wondered why in the world did Paul go on to a whole new chapter after he talked about the resurrection. And I think it's simply this. I think that we need to understand that Paul has a method. There's systematic, if you will, teaching that he goes through with people in all of his letters in which we need to respond. And it's no different here. He, he's taught on the resurrection and he's taught on the value of the resurrection. He's taught on the fact that you and I too, if Christ was raised, one day we will be raised. If Christ has a new glorified body that can walk through walls, you and I will have a new glorified body that will walk through walls. He's taught on this very, very important truth that you and I, if Christ was resurrected, we too one day will be resurrected to eternal life. And he teaches on this. And then he goes into this other teaching. And you're like, what in the world is he doing? Why is he writing on this? Well, here's, here's the truth. The gospel matters so much that he has a teaching on it. that we don't need to get caught up just for our glory that one day we will be resurrected. That for us, we will have a new body. That for us, we will have eternal life and a glorified body. He wants us to make sure that we understand that, like as, as brother Pastor Nick said a while ago, everybody, by the way, will be resurrected. There will be two resurrections in the future. One for the saints that will be with Christ for eternity, and one for those who are without Christ to judgment. And so there will be two resurrections. And he wants us to understand that it's not about the resurrection that we live moving forward. It's about the impact that the gospel, that the resurrection has on us and how we should then in turn live our lives. And so today we're going to talk about three things in here that I see in some scripture that I think are important for us to learn that Paul would want us to know. And that's this. The first thing is the gospel impacts our finances. The gospel impacts our finances. He moves right in here. Therefore, my beloved brothers, in verse 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your neighbor's not your labor is not in vain. And then he moves right into this collection for the saints. He says, I, I, there's a cause, there's a reason, and I asked Galatia to do it, and I'm asking you to do it. I, I'm asking you to take up this cause, to take up this collection. It's not by accident that Paul has done this, because the gospel impacts every part of our life. Amen. Our faith is in Christ. It's in Christ alone, and it is in Christ fully and completely. And listen, I think this is important to what Paul's trying to say here. You know what this includes? It includes our money. It includes our finances. It includes our wallets. The truth is many of us worship it, don't we? We earned it. We worked hard for it. We made it. And therefore, because of that, I want to use it. Paul saying, hey, now concerning the collection for the saints. Do you see what he's doing here? Now concerning the collection for the saints. Did you notice Paul didn't say it was optional? <laughs> I ain't going to be truthful. Paul didn't say it was optional. Paul said, now concerning the collection of the saints. He is assuming that they are going to do what God has commanded them to do, and he is going, they're going to take up this collection for the saints. Giving is not an option. Giving is a result of our faith. I, if any of you know who Mike Donahue is, he's the lead singer for 10th Avenue North. And we talked about this in our life group class today, and that's not in my notes, but I'm going to point this out. He was asked, do you sing your songs to God? And he said, no, I don't sing songs to God. Listen. He said, but I sing songs because of God. You see the difference there about his attitude? He said, God didn't give him a guitar and a voice to sing God, songs to God. God gave him a guitar and a voice because of who God is. Don't you see the Galatians 5-1 moment there? The freedom that is found in Christ when we give our life to Christ. All of a sudden, us giving to God is because of what he did for us first. We don't give our collection to the saints to God. We give it because of God. It is a result of our faith. The Lord wants you and I to give. He wants to test us. 
He wants to see how faithful we will be with what he's given us. You do realize it is him who gave it to you first, right? Think of it this way. You say, okay, pastor, give me an example, a modern day example today of how we could see this. Here's one. If you have children, at some point in your life, you've given your kids an allowance. And you've probably overpaid them. Some of you cheap people might have underpaid them. Like, here's a quarter for cleaning your room. But most of the time, we overpay our kids, right? Because why? We know that they're working for something. They want something. And we say, we're going to teach them, and we're going to teach them how to do some things. And so we're going to let them work for it, and we're going to give them chores, and we're going to give them some money, and we're going to watch them save it up so that when they go buy that thing they want and they get that thrill or that enjoyment that they've accomplished something, we too are excited for them, aren't we? Who owned it first, though? You did. Who worked hard for it first? You did. Whose back pocket did it come out of? Yours. But did you not get satisfaction watching your kids learn something very valuable by what you gave them? This is exactly who Jesus is. Jesus owns it all and therefore he gives us it and he enjoys watching how we use it. But listen, he gave us directions on how we should use it. And a lot of times we want to go, and I'll get there, we want to go to Malachi, the end of the New Testament, and act like this is something he did at the end of the, New Te- at the Old Testament before he writes the New Testament. But listen, that's not true. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, it says this, And the stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and all of that you give me I will give a full tenth to you. He's already started this whole process of giving back to him. In the very beginning of the Bible, he says, bring it in. The tithe, our giving, has been something that the Lord has directed since the beginning of creation. You know why? You know why this is such a big deal to God? Why there's so many verses on this topic in the Bible today? Because he knows that how we use it will reveal our faith. It it reveals how we will handle it. Deuteronomy 16 verse 17 says, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord your God that he has given you. Do you understand, do you see what you have as a blessing from the Lord? Deuteronomy says, recognize that blessing and Give accordingly doesn't look like an option to me. I I know the argument. I hear it. As a pastor, we hear it all the time, actually. It's a sad, it's a sad argument that in my opinion, but we but we hear it. You say, but Pastor, you don't you don't know my bills. You don't understand what I have to pay for, and and it's hard for me to do this because I have to pay my bills. Listen, I understand there are things that happen. It is happening in our community today. There are some that in a few weeks will be losing their job. And I understand they may fall on a little bit of a hard time. And I understand, honestly, that our Lord is gracious and merciful. And if they can't give for a moment of time and a season in their life because they've lost their job, I get it. But you know what the problem is? Most of us have set ourselves up to the max anyway that we can't give when we're both working. Listen, this is the same statement you've heard before. When it comes to our faith, I say, show me your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. Our checkbook reveals our level of faith. Malachi, here we go, chapter 3, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out down for you a blessing until there is need, no more need. Listen, when he says here that there may be food in my house, listen, I think this is, has a double meaning. I think, number one, he's talking about us as a church being able to help people in our community with tangible needs. We have this happen all the time. We have people call asking us to put them up in a hotel. We have people call all the time asking us to buy them a meal. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But I can tell you this, it's never us that make that decision. We have people that we contact that are deacons in charge of that stuff. And we say, listen, we talk to this person. We believe this may be a good cause. Or we say, you may need to talk to this person because this may or may not be a good cause. But you make the final decision. And here's what I know. Whether we do it or make a bad decision or we make a good decision, here's what I can tell you. The word of God has been told that's never a bad decision church whether that person uses the money wrong or not that is not on us but we have to have those needs 
If, if we are robbing God, we cannot do those things. And I also think that this also has to do with a spiritual message. The food of God, the word of God. Without tithes and offerings brought into the storehouse, we cannot effectively give the word of God out. We can't go on mission trips. We can't send our students to a retreat that they're fixing to go on. We, we just can't do the kind of things that we need to do. And the Bible says here in Malachi, will we rob God? He calls it when we don't give, robbing him. I, I love the end of this verse. It says, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I realize sometimes we're going to be pushed to the max. We're going to give when it hurts. But Jesus says, just trust me. Be faithful. You know what he's telling us? Exercise our faith over our fear. When it comes to giving, when it comes to bringing our tithes and our offerings, when that plate is passed or you walk by those giving boxes, when you're online and you want to go online to our website and donate that way, listen, when, it, it, when it's hard, Jesus is saying, is your faith bigger than your fear? Just need to remember, if you're a child of God, He's going to bless you, He's going to care for you. And so there's a process in giving that I think we see here in the text that I want to give you today to help you with your obedience in this, and, in this area. But first, I want you to understand a couple of things. God wants us to put our treasure in the right place. You know what I've learned the older I get? That the Lord has the best bank. That He offers the greatest return on our investment. We cannot out. Give Him we don't have to worry about that bank ever closing its doors and our investment being bad. He has the best bank. Matthew 6 is where he tells us this. Verse 19, Do not lay up yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. And then there's this Great principle in Acts 20, 35 says, In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So here's the process found in our text today. A couple of things that I want you to see. Number one about our giving. Giving is an act of worship. Look at verse 2. On the first day of every week. It's an act of worship. We come here every week on Sunday to worship our God, our Creator, our Savior. And when we come to do that, to offer God our worship, He's asking us to come and bring our very best. And this includes the offering time. You notice when we pray up here over the offering, we say this is another chance for us to worship God. Listen, I don't want your money. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He will meet every need that this church has as long as we pursue Him. I don't need your money. What I want you to understand is I want you to receive the blessing that He promises you. That's why we give you the opportunity to worship God in your giving. Because He wants to bless you. It is an act of worship. And when we come full heart, fully open, exposed, doing everything we can to give Him the glory, it's not because we do it to Him. What did Mike say? It's because of what He did for us. It's an act of worship. It should be systematic. He says, on the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside. He said something Set something aside. This is, uh, in, is something that you put in your mind that you're going to do that requires you to let go of it with your hands. Set it systematic. Some of you can do this even more today in an even easier way because we do online giving and it lets you set up just a consistent giving. It takes it out on every day that you set it up systematically. G Paul saying here, set it up. Something aside. Listen to what else he says. Giving is personal. I said this. We, we give because it's personal. We give because we know there are going to be people of the faith, people of our house, people of this church who may need help. And you know what? We need to be ready to do it. 
I have a situation right now, and if I haven't called you, I'm sorry, but if you're in your heart right now, there's a situation going on where somebody needs our help. I've reached out to several different people. Several of you have stepped up and said you want to help. Maybe I didn't reach out to you, and maybe you're saying, hey, I don't want to know all the details. I just want to help. Here's 100 bucks. Here's 200 bucks. Here's 50 bucks. Here's 5 bucks. Listen, we are taking up a collection behind the scene right now to help somebody that's just fallen on a weird situation. And so we give because it's personal. There is one of our own who has a situation that is beyond their means right now, beyond their control. And so we give so that we can meet these needs. Listen, another thing, giving should be proportionate. If you're blessed with more, you should give more. It's just simple. If you're blessed with more, you should give more. It's not equal giving, church. It's equal sacrifice. I was trying to figure out the other day between my wife and I, and if I'm going to lead by example as a pastor, I'm just going to share you. Sherry and I tithe about 15% of our overall income. So we're not at 10. We're at 15. And I ask her all the time, how in the world can we do that? And let me tell you how we can do that. Because the Lord blesses us. The Lord provides for us. And so we need to be proportionate. Uh, it's equal sacrifice. And let me, let me finish with this right here. He says, but I will, he says right here in verse 3, And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. What he's saying here is that the money must be handled honestly. If you've learned anything about me over the last four years, you'll understand this is an area that I handle very delicately. And that I'm involved in, that I pay attention to. Probably to some people's mind, they probably think too much. But listen, it matters to me what we do with God's money. Just so you know, when I got here, we were giving less than 1% away to the Florida Baptist Convention and the New River Baptist Association. I think it was 1.25%, if I'm going to be honest with you. Today, we give 7% of our tithes and offerings away to the Florida Baptist Convention, the New River Baptist Found, uh, uh, Network now, and First Coast Churches, formerly known as Jacksonville Baptist Association. 7% of our income has gone away. Our tithes and offerings have doubled in four years. Because we give more. We're, we're, listen, my goal is over the next few years to get us to 10% minimum. I think if we're going to ask our church to tie the minimum of 10%, we need to be a tithing 10% church. Listen, we cannot outgive God. And I am trying to tell you that we're going to handle this honestly. Listen, our debt's gone from $1.6 million. It will probably be around 500000 by January of this year in four short years. Amen. Like, we handle it honestly. And so we have things set up around here with people set up and groups set up and committees set up to make sure that we do what we say we're going to do with the finances that God gives us. We take it very seriously. So it's an act of worship. Give systematically. Make it personal. Be proportionate and understand that you can trust us with what we do with it. But the last thing that I want you to see in this area is that our attitude. I, I think he, he talks about here about our attitude in this text. The first thing we need to understand is that he owns it all. I've already said that. Psalms 50, 12 is one of the areas where I would get this. If I were hungry, this is God speaking, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Think about that for a moment. God said, I'm not asking you for nothing. I, I give you what I want to give you. I don't, I don't need it. The fullness of the world are his. So we need to think about our, our own attitude. He wants to give us freely. The greatest example of him giving us the most expensive gift was Jesus. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We are to give cheerfully, not begrudgingly. I have a ministry, a not-for-profit ministry, some of you know about, called Open Handed Ministries out of Deuteronomy. Give with an open hand. Don't be tight-fisted. Sacrifice and do it cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. It's an attitude that we should have. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. We've already preached on this, but if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What is he saying here? It's not just a handful of people's responsibility to meet the needs of this church. It's all of our responsibility. United, together, the load is a lot. The load is heavy, but when we all come together united in all aspects of our worship, that load becomes light, and it's shared by all. So because of the resurrection, 
because of our hope in the resurrection, because it is for sure, our faith is sure, then we can be comfortable, we can be satisfied, we can be this cheerful giver that God has called us to be. Because giving is not an option. The gospel impacts our finances. Do you find joy in your salvation? If you find joy in your salvation, you should find joy in obedience in your finances. I want you to see what else this, this was to the church, by the way. So if you're visiting with us today, that was to our members. But there's some, honestly, there's some important stuff you can learn too about being obedient to God. But here's the second thing I want you to see. Is not only does the gospel, act, gospel impact our finances, but it impacts our relationships. Paul says here in verse 5 that he intends to come to them. He's going to pass through Macedonia. He's going to come visit them. He wants to spend time with them. Matter of fact, he says, I want to come and spend the whole winter with you. Because if you know anything about that area, they didn't travel back then because the seas were too rough in the winter time. And so Paul's telling them, hey, this is my desire that I come and I be with you over the winter. But you know something, church? When we get into 2 Corinthians, if we were to go there, we're not going there next. We'll come back to it at some point in time. But you know Paul didn't make it for the winter? Paul never made it to Corinth in the winter. And you're thinking, wait a second, pastor. If this is the inspired word of God and God is behind the author of it, why did he allow Paul to write in here that he wished he could be there, but then he never honored it by letting him be there? Doesn't that make the word of God a lie? No. No. I don't want you to see why. Because it impacts our relationships. I think this is important. We all have desires for God don't we? we? We all have things we want to do for God, and we, we set out to do them, right? Because we think, this is what God wants me to do. But then we get that three little word, but there's God. He will accomplish His plan. We're not guaranteed to accomplish ours. I think that's what God's trying to get us to understand here, is that he has a plan. He is sovereign. He is the ruler. He is in control. And even though sometimes we make our own plans, but God is going to accomplish his plan, not our plan. Listen, it happens around here all the time. (laughs) If you've been around me any length of a time and any serious amount of time, you understand that I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of plans. And I I like to talk about a lot of things and start moving a lot of things. It's one of the shocks that I think Pastor Nick has walked into here is, man, you guys are busy. Man, you guys are doing a lot of stuff. you got a lot of plans going on. But listen, sometimes we move towards them. But the Lord stops us. And he refocuses us and he makes us look at, is this our plan or his plan? Are we doing what he wants us to do or are we doing what we want to do? Our first responsibility as a church and as leaders and you in your personal life is not to your own plan or our plan, but to God's plan. Psalm 143.8 says, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. The Bible says we're to move, but we're to move where the Lord leads. We're to move where the Lord wants us to go, making sure that we're not getting way out ahead of Him or making the wrong turn. If we're obeying God, we'll recognize this when we start to go wrong or we start to follow a plan maybe He had different plans on. We'll we'll recognize His voice and very quickly be able to get back on course and move in the direction that He wants us to move. Remember I said about obedience. Our first relationship that the gospel impacts is with God. And we're to be obedient to Him first. He also impacts our relationship with others. This is the, what I would call the open door to ministry. Look at the example of Jesus in Hebrews 12 verse 2. says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. I don't know about you, but I don't know that enduring a cross would be joyful despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus cared more about his relationship with you than the cross. And so we need to look at this, how Jesus felt about us, that he was willing to go the hard mile, that he was willing to do the extra stuff, that he was willing to take on the pain and the consequences of our sin, that that he cared enough about us, that it impacted our relationship with him. He's showing us that that's the same type of attitude we need to have with others. What is the will of God? 
Sometimes we think that we understand the will of God, that the will of God is, 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 is unique to each individual person. But here, I'm going to tell you, I think the, the will of God is simple. I think the Scripture teaches what the will of God is. And I think that if we would understand this, it might help us in our mission. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. I don't know that this is on the screen, guys. But in, chapter, in verse 16, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? It's that we would be sanctified Him and that we would tell other people about Him. The will of God is that the lost would be saved. So, how do we do this impacting our relationship with others? I I think there's some verses that we can use to follow in our own lives, like Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is hard, isn't it? Are you holding on to anger? Bitterness or malice towards somebody? Church, we are not to do so. Forgiveness is the attitude of Christ that we're to have. We're to forgive. We're to care more about the relationship than we are the issue. So we need to learn to let it go. Galatians 6.10, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. It says do good, especially to other believers. Care about the relationship more than you do yourself. It's hard. Battling this world and trying to find more time is very, very difficult. We don't need to be battling each other in the process. President McKinley was on a campaign trail, and he had a journalist who followed him who he didn't like. And that journalist didn't like him. And he rode with this group as they traveled to different campaign spots. And he would always write these negative arguments about McKinley. And one day when they were traveling by stagecoach, and McKinley was inside, headed to the next stop. And he heard the, the young man outside sitting in this rainy, cold weather coughing. And he knew he was getting sick, so he stopped the horse carriage. And he got out, and he asked the young man to step down off of the carriage. And he put a coat around him, and he said, get inside. He said, sir, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I am the one who writes all these negative articles about you? He said, yes, so now get in here and get well so that you can do your job well. This is caring about people this is doing good to others listen if he i don't know if mckinley was a believer or not but man could you imagine the outcome if he was to his own enemy he was doing good we are to do good to others it impacts our relationship in one other way i want you to see look at verse 12 now concerning our brother apollos i strongly urged him to visit you with other brothers but it was not at all his will to come now he will come when he has opportunity. You remember earlier in the scripture when, it, when there was all the factions? Some say Paul, some say Apollos. And they were following different preachers. Well, here is Apollos being able to do what's right. And Apollos said, I'm not going. Because I don't want to create any more controversy. I don't want to create any more division because the people aren't ready because they're not really following Christ. They're following the wrong thing. And so Paul has said, we are not in competition, Paul. We're on the same team. So when I get a chance to go, I will go. Listen, we need to hear this. What I'm fixing to say, we need to hear church. Bible-believing churches even of other denominations, are not our competitor. They're our partners. You know what else? The believer sitting beside you, not your competitor. They're your brother or your sister. We don't need any more competition in the church of our living Savior. We are to be united in the cause of the gospel. I think it's important of why he writes this after the resurrection. Because it impacts our finances. It impacts our relationships. And then the last thing that I, the last thing that I think I see here in the text today is that the gospel impacts our commitments. Paul gives a reminding instruction in verse 13. He says, be watchful. 
Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. He says be watchful. Paul's telling us that, hey, we need to be careful. We need to be alert. We need to know what we're looking for. Why? Because we have a real enemy. We have someone who really wants to destroy us and that we need to be watchful. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. Did you catch that? We're not ignorant of his designs. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Just in those two scriptures alone, did you catch that? We, we know the will or the plan of Satan. We know his schemes. We know his devices. And we know they're to harm us. So we're to be watchful because he's coming to steal, kill, and destroy Listen, church, we need to be watchful for him. It's one of the reasons, church, we're doing a new members class coming up. It's one of the reasons we take covenantal membership so strong here. Because we're watchful. We want to make sure that those that we receive into the faith, those that your pastors bring in a family meeting, in a congregational meeting of family members that are in Christ, when we bring them and present them to you, we want you to know that we have found them worthy to be members be watchful it goes on to says stand firm jude in verse 9 says but when the archangel michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of moses he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment but said the lord rebuke you did you catch that stand firm why even the angel was not going to uh, be able to do anything against satan but the angel knew the power source He knew where the power to defeat Satan was going to come from. So what did he do? He turned to the Lord. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Well, if the archangel Michael's not strong enough to rebuke the devil, listen, I don't think you or myself is able to do it either. We're not going to be able under our own power to be able to rebuke the Lord. But listen, we have the same source of power. It's Jesus. Listen. Go back to the resurrection. We just finished it. Who has the power of life and death? It's only the Lord. It's only Him. And so we need to stand firm in this and understand that it is He who will guide us and will protect us and direct us in our faith. It is how we stand firm is in the name of the Lord. And then lastly, he says, act like men. Jude 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. What is he saying here? Act like men. He is not talking about men necessarily as the male species. What he's talking about is grow up. What he's talking about is be mature in your faith. Pursue the deeper things of God. And by the way, while you do all of this stuff for the Lord, by the way, do it the way Jesus did it. Uh, do it in love. Do it in love. This is the example that Christ gave us. We have commitments towards other as well. When we think about these commitments, listen, we, we see that we're to comfort them. He talked about how Stephanus and them brought comfort to Paul. Isaiah 41 says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. With the comfort with which we we receive ourselves are comforted by, we ourselves are comforted by God. This world is dark. This world is evil. There are bad things that happen to good people all the time, and we need to be a comfort to the Lord because we have received comfort from the Lord. We're to be comforters as well. I don't know about y'all. I'm going to give you a little... I'm going to tell my wife for a moment when it talks about comforters. How many of you, though, like when you go to bed at night to just pull that comforter up? Just tuck yourself in so you can get a good night's sleep. Does it help you sleep? My wife likes the heavier the blanket, the better. And I'm just kicking that stuff off of me because it makes me hot. But don't you like, though, when you're ready to just, after church today, you're ready to go sit in your favorite recliner and just pull a blanket up, just comfort, know you're at peace, you can just close your eyes and go to sleep. It's not everybody has that. There's a family in our own community today that's struggling. 
Many of you know them. It even hit Sherry and I pretty hard too because they're from Middleburg as well. They're struggling today. They need our comfort. And we're to comfort with the same comfort that God has comforted us. So we need love on them. We need each other, church. It's part of our commitment. Psalm 90, verse 17 says, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Our commitment should cause us to get out and to go help people. The last storm that came through, we had situations where there were a few of you that had to go help somebody get out of their driveway because trees came across. We have all the tools that we need to be able to be used by God. And we need to just understand that we use them because we're in the potter's hand. Be available. I would say the last thing about our commitments that we need to remember is this. We need to keep Christ preeminent. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Last week we talked about, or in this resurrection, that he was the resurrection. He was the first fruit guaranteeing us and our own resurrections. He is the preeminent one. We must keep him the priority in everything we do from our way of living to our way of giving. Whether that's our time, talent, or treasure because apart from that there's no other purpose there's no reason it's the reason we keep Christ first he's the main truth listen he is coming back church John chapter 5 verse 28 says do not marvel at this (laughs) do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out Think about this for a moment. To the dust in which you churn, you you return, but yet you will hear his voice and come out. Listen, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. This will happen at his rapture, at the return of Christ. We will hear him. Those who know his voice will hear his voice and be raptured out of the grave. But it goes on to say, and those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment, there will come a time where at the end of time, when God is ready to recreate the new, all of those who are still dead and buried will rise to judgment. There is resurrection coming. He is coming back. And for us, church, it's to everlasting life. But I don't want you to miss this part. To those who don't no, Jesus, it is to an eternal judgment in hell. Our commitment should be to be partnered with Christ, fulfilling the will, His will, and that is that all may come to know Him. We should be out sharing about this everlasting life. We should be out desiring that all would be saved. Because the Scripture just told us there is no one exempt from resurrection there is no one exempt from either his blessing or his judgment here's the question do you want forgiveness do you want restoration when you've done something wrong in your life isn't that a great feeling that when you've done something wrong in your life and you you, you, you finally deal with it and you finally handle it and all of a sudden this forgiveness is given and there's this restoration of relationship. There's this great peace that overcomes your soul at that point in time. Don't you desire that? Don't you long for that? Don't you enjoy that feeling? Well, listen, this is exactly what happens every time somebody comes to the Lord. It's the peace they get. Amen. And so we need to be about that commitment. We need to be about sharing the love of God. We need to be about giving so that we can go and do this. We need to be about helping in all causes. We need to love all. There is no second chance in hell. There is no purgatory. There is no box sitting there where people are going to get in it and you can pray or pay the people out of that. It's a personal decision you make by faith to have eternal life. It is a faith, according to Ephesians 2, that you're saved, not a works that you can be saved. It's by faith. 
And so there's only one life to live. I've told you this before. And there's only one life to win them. But there's all of eternity to celebrate those that we share. We need to be about commitment. We need to be about the will of God. So the gospel. The reason why I think Paul finished this section out in the way he did is because I think there's some ways that he wants us to understand how impactful the gospel is and the resurrection of Jesus is in our life. Because it challenges us to be found faithful in our faith. In our new life and be found faithful in our service to him. It, it's because the gospel impacts our finances. The gospel impacts our relationships. The gospel impacts our commitment to the Lord. So church, it's through these ways right here that the gospel impacts us that we make Christ known. And I can promise you we are going to do everything we can at Northside Baptist Church to make Christ no, you'll hear more of an opportunity we have coming in the month of November that we're going to be playing in October and November. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all kinds of resources, both time, talent, and trust. It's going to take it all. But listen, I'm telling you, it's going to be a blessing to our community. I'll explain more later. But we're going to seek to make Christ known. Amen. And so the gospel impacts everything that we do. So I'm going to ask you a question today. Has the gospel impacted you? (laughs) And how has it impacted you? Has it changed you? Has it refreshed you? Has it made you new? Has it given you peace? Do you follow because of legalism or do you follow because of what was done for you? Maybe today you've never truly accepted Christ. Maybe you've never received that peace, that comfort that comes from Him. Well, today we're going to give you a chance to do that. Pastor Nick will be up here leading us in song. Pastor Gary and I will be down front to receive you, to talk to you about salvation. We just want to get some information from you and then sit down and be able to schedule a time to be able to talk to you in depth. Listen, salvation, it's an important decision. And we we want to make sure that you understand exactly what you are doing. You give your life to Christ. Notice what Jesus didn't say. (laughs) Nowhere in Scripture did Jesus say, Hey, I want you all to get this. Walk an aisle and you're saved. You know what Jesus said to Levi? To Matthew? He said, You, follow me. By faith, Matthew got up and followed Jesus. Are you following Jesus today? Have you turned your life over and he is the direction, he is your source, he is the power that you're plugged into? Today can be that day of salvation. So when you come, we want to be able to talk to you about plugging into the proper power source, about following Jesus, about genuine salvation in Christ and Christ alone. Maybe today you want to join the church. Maybe you need to come forth and be to tell us you need to be baptized. I think there's going to be a baptism, ne- baptism next week. I think there's one after that. And I know of a third one that's coming on the horizon as well. Maybe you're one of those that says, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus, but I've never been baptized. You can come and you can let us know and we'll document you. We'll put it down so we can get that scheduled as well. Or maybe, just maybe, this message has hit you that this gospel hasn't impacted you in all the areas of your life that it should. And maybe you need to come to these altars and cast your cares and your concern and your issues with the Lord here at the altar so I'm going to pray and when I say amen I'm going to just ask you to respond respond in an act of worship to what God is doing in your heart today so I'm going to ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes as the team comes up to lead us in worship during this moment join me in prayer if you would God we come now to a time of the service where we respond to your word Will we respond to the power of the Holy Spirit in our life? The Bible says in John that you draw all men unto yourselves. And I pray, God, I know there's somebody that you are drawing into salvation today. That you're drawing them in to confess and to believe that you are God. That you paid the price. And your resurrection is evidence of it. And so, God, I pray that over these next few moments you would have your way. If there's somebody here who doesn't know you, who's never given their life to you, who's never surrendered their life in salvation to you, God, in in an attitude and a posture of surrender to follow you, I pray today, God, would be the day of salvation. God, maybe there's somebody here who needs to be baptized. Maybe there's somebody here that wants to join the church. God, I pray that you would bring them forward, that this would be their response, their act of worship and their decision today. And I pray, God, if nothing else, I pray the altars are full of your people coming to do business with you. 
Now, we don't care what they're praying. We don't know what they're praying, God, but they are coming and seeking your face. And this is an opportunity that we have during this time of the service to worship you in our prayer life, in our personal life. And bringing our cares and concerns and leaving them here and giving them to you. So God, I pray that over these next few moments, God, that we would be sincere. And that we would worship you in our response. So have your way now. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.